Hi there. In this video, we'll look at the story of long-term capital management and their rise and fall from glory, and how it relates to the book Fooled by Randomness. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the following references. You'll see these referenced throughout the video going forward, and you can check out all these links for yourself in the links in the bio. To give you some background on long-term capital management, the firm was founded in 1994, and its board of directors featured Myron Scholes and Robert Merton, who together shared in the 1997 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences for, quote, a new method to determine the value of derivatives. Those two, along with Fisher Black, created what's known as the Black-Scholes-Merton model, which models the price of European-style options. In using this model, theoretically, traders could buy options that are less than the Black-Scholes-Merton at price estimate and sell options that are priced higher than the model suggests. Before we get into the details of the Black-Scholes-Merton model, I think it's important to bring up Ed Thorpe. In 1962, he published Beat the Dealer, which detailed how one could gain a significant advantage over the house in blackjack through card counting. In his following years, he turned his studies to the markets and developed a similar formula for options pricing in 1967. His work was eventually cited in The Pricing of Options and Corporate Liabilities, which was the first publication of the Black Scholes Merton model. And it can be speculated that Thorpe doesn't have the notoriety as that Black Scholes and Merton later achieved because his work was used more in industry by himself and was not published in an academic setting. European options can only be exercised on a predetermined expiration date. So for the Black-Scholes-Merton model, that means between the time that you purchase the option and the time when it's expiring, the following assumptions must hold. Risk-free interest rates and market volatility must stay constant. Returns on a security must be normally distributed with the price being log normally distributed and there are no costs in the trading as well as perfect market liquidity. So one of long-term capital management's core strategies involved the arbitrage of the fixed income markets where they would buy older less liquid bonds trading at they what believed to be a discount all the while shorting the newly issued bonds that were more liquid with the idea that the discounted bonds price would eventually rise and the newly issued in bonds price would fall. And due to the relatively small differences in price for these transactions, long-term capital management would have to leverage themselves significantly to see significant returns. Long-term capital management was very successful in leveraging their positions, initially due to the cachet of their board members and then because of their extreme success. This funding was generally found through leverage, where long-term capital management would lar borrow large amounts of capital using their options contracts as collateral. When these positions would pay off, they would then pay back the loan, as well as keep the gain that they had earned from the contract. During this time, they performed at almost 40% annualized compounded returns from 1994 to 97, and as such, at the beginning of 1998, the firm had equity of $4.7 billion, and it had borrowed over $124 billion, which was then used to hold positions worth over $1 trillion. Extreme trouble struck long-term capital management on Monday, August 17, 1998, when Russia defaulted on its domestic bonds. By the end of that month, long-term capital management managed to lose $1.5 billion. And these massive losses caused the firm to close out of many other positions at extremely dis disadvantageous time. Shortly thereafter, in mid to late September, long-term capital management was bailed out by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York with the retain partners retaining only $400 million. In retrospect, long-term capital management claims this turn of events to be a 10 sigma event. So how is it that long-term capital management went from having $5 billion in assets to being bailed out in less than two months? When Russia defaulted on their domestic bonds, there was a rush to safer, more liquid bonds. This rush to liquidity hurt long-term capital management on both sides of their core trading strategy in that prices rose for the safer, 
more liquid bonds where long-term capital management was short and then prices dropped on the riskier more illiquid bonds where long-term capital management was going long. The Russian crisis also caused global instability which depressed their other positions that needed to be sold due to the fixed income losses. When Russia defaulted on their domestic bonds, there were a few black scholes merton assumptions that were broken. The first being perfect market liquidity. When a model assumes perfect market liquidity, it does not foresee a run on more liquid bonds causing that price to inflate, as that wouldn't happen in a market with perfect liquidity. The second being constant market volatility. When they defaulted on these bonds, it created a large amount of uncertainty in the markets, which caused prices to change rapidly, thus being much more volatile. And with that volatility, the assumption of normal returns and log normal pricing was broken as well. So, was long-term capital management fooled by randomness? During their period of success, from 1994 to 97, market volatility stayed relatively constant, which played into their hand for their fixed income arbitrage in making the bonds prices a little more predictable because they didn't have to worry about the ups and downs of the market. Yet, when Russia defaulted on their bonds, long-term capital management claimed the circumstances to be a 10 sigma event. Could they truly have been that unlucky? Taleb writes about the human condition where you ascribe your successes to your skills, like the period of low volatility in the market and doing extremely well during that time being your great predictability of the, of the markets and your failures to be ascribed to bad luck being a 10 sigma event, when in reality they were more than likely not all that unlucky, just hadn't prepared for a black swan event like Russia defaulting on their bonds. So in order to learn from the mistakes that were made by LTCM, it's important to recognize the assumptions that one makes decisions off. Additionally, it's important to recognize the amount of randomness in life and act accordingly. For the case of long term, it seems that they didn't think that randomness played any part in their wild success from 1994 to 97, which is why even in the face of broken assumptions, they still stayed to their models and acted accordingly. Had they not acted as if they were masters of the universe, as Taleb would call them, traders that completely understood how everything worked at all times, and accepted that there's randomness in the markets, they probably wouldn't have stuck to such extreme positions, even while seeing that some of their assumptions had been broken. For a few closing words here, I would suggest that every now and then, you look at the assumptions that you're making your decisions off of and just question them to make sure that they're still valid and that they still apply to your current situation. Additionally, try to accept the amount of randomness in life and maybe not immediately let successes go to your head as well as, as writing off what your failures may be. In this way, accepting the randomness that you may have had something to do with it as well as it could have just been a random act that affected you in a certain way.